Isaac, uh, the apprentice. So, um, welcome to the panel, and thank you very much for having us here. And we have 11 people on the panel. We have 75 minutes, so that means everybody gets an hour. <laughs> um, for all of you who think you should be on this panel, we only have 11. Uh, we were thinking of having 12. If we had 12, you would be on the panel. So just imagine that if you missed it barely. But thank you all for uh, coming, and I want to thank you for hosting us. And uh, let me just uh, say at the very beginning, I don't think there's ever been a panel with as big an assemblage of financial talent and skill as you've been able to put together here. So thank you for doing this. Um, I'll try to go around alphabetically generally, but why don't we start with our host? So, um, yeah, sir, uh, tell me on AI, and I, I point out uh, AI is a major subject you're interested in. Uh, I noticed that Saudi Arabia has in both words AI. Now, maybe that's a coincidence, but uh, AI is obviously something you're focused on. And how do you think that you can make AI and can be made inclusive? so that people aren't left behind? And are you 100% convinced that AI is going to be a benefit for society as opposed to a detriment? Thank you. Um, I mean, AI started, um, I think, back in 2014, but the generative AI, which is the new thing. And um, it requires a lot. It requires um, the infrastructure, which is the... Uh, chips, it requires the platforms, the data centers, uh, and all the um, uh, other uh, apps to work with it. I mean, now what we're seeing uh, with the, um, you know, chat GBT and the other uh, AI platforms is just a tip of the iceberg. This is just the beginning. Okay. So, we need to get all the, um, all the uh, companies that generates the apps with the companies that generates the um, chips, the data centers, to work with the governments to have <coughs> some kind of an accord or some agreement on how to use and harness AI for good. Mm -hmm. And to do so, we have to be, to be more inclusive. We cannot just make the AI as an exclusive uh, thing. So you have um, many models, the, uh, uh, the closed uh, um, model and the open model. And we have seen some of the closed um, uh, model, the closed source model, that is either uh, certain ideology or politics plays a lot. And there is a big difference between what the Internet is today and what AI uh, is doing. So it has to be a, a collaboration. Countries have to work to have some kind of a strategy or agreements. Not only countries, but I think um, supranational organization like uh, the United Nations or the uh, World Bank or some of these big uh, entities, they have to work together with different countries on making AI more inclusive. So you pointed out in your opening remarks, AI consumes a lot of electricity. In other words, to make AI work, it, there's a lot of electricity that has to be consumed. Are you convinced that the, um, the, the effects of all the electricity that's generated all of the climate change that might be affected by AI is worth the benefit. In other words, is it really going to be beneficial for society to use as much additional uh, electricity uh, to get the benefits of AI? It is, no doubt, in my mind. I mean, generative AI is um, the second um, phase of AI. Then we will go maybe to the super AI sometime in the future. Um, so all of this would need huge data centers, and that's why we were talking to everyone, and we started building so many data centers, and the world needs more data centers. Now, the problem is, to your point, the uh, power consumption with this uh, data centers. And as I said in my opening remarks, you will um, just one day of chat GBT learning is the equivalent of about 26,000 homes in the U.S., which 
consumes a lot of uh, energy. So we have to work on uh, um, how we can balance, you know, the pros and cons of the use of uh, AI. What we are doing, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, I think is a good solution. We, in our, in our targets, by the year 2030, we want to have 50% of our power uh, generation to be based on renewable, and the other 50 will be based on gas, which emit less than uh, liquid. So we have to invest more in the renewable uh, energy. If you look at the targets by 2040, <laughs> I think it's 283 trillion dollars needed to be um, invested uh, cumulatively from the year 2020 until uh, 2040. We haven't achieved much. What we have achieved so far is like 1.7 last year or 1.2 <coughs> trillion. So that means we have to pace our investments or deployment by five trillion in annual base globally. Final question at this point. Um, you are the chairman of Saudi Aramco, which is the largest corporate uh, oil producer in the world. You're also the head of PIF, which is uh, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. As the head of PIF, you're responsible for producing roughly 70 percent of the alternative energy that is supposed to be produced in, this, in the right. kingdom, yet you're also producing an enormous amount of non-alternative energy at uh, at uh, Saudi Aramco. How do you balance the two? Every day do you wake up and say, I'm going to do a little bit of alternative energy, I'm going to do some mm -hmm. for carbon energy. How do you balance this? Uh, that's a great question. Actually, what we're doing in Aramco is, sh should be, sh all the oil and gas uh, companies mm -hmm. should really consider doing. We are the lowest emitter when it comes to the um, oil and gas uh, production, by far. If the other oil and gas companies uh, start doing what Aramco is doing in their production, I think we can reduce the emission by, um, uh, by big numbers. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's the equivalent of one-third of the both residential and commercial emission in the world. So if we can do that, that will be a great thing. But the problem, the that most of the oil and gas companies have, they're not incentivized enough by their governments to, to do something like that. While in PIF, we are doing 70%, as you said, of the renewable uh, energy. We're trying to balance things, and we're working a lot with Aramco. They're co-investing uh, with most of uh, our initiatives, in addition to what they're trying to do now in the blue hydrogen and the sequestration which will reduce all the uh, emissions. So I don't see any okay. contradiction of what I'm doing in both uh, entities. So as the head of PIF, do you ever have an experience where somebody comes to you and doesn't tell you they have a great investment idea for you to invest in? <laughs> do you ever have that where somebody doesn't give you a great idea when they're talking to you to, for you to invest I'm in? I'm sorry, I don't understand this question. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody comes of up course, to you. Of course, no, I do understand Everybody the question. Comes Everybody, comes, Everybody comes to us, of course, with the, with the greatest idea on the face <laughs> of the earth or history. And uh, we're really Im uh, inviting them to do so, but we do have a huge process, big process, on you know, filtering all the uh, things, mm -hmm. looking at the benefits mm -hmm. versus the risk. Mm -hmm. We've uh, done, of course, really some great investments, and we're really mm -hmm. proud of it. Uh, we have less failure investments, which is a good. That means our system and framework and governance is working. Okay. Let me turn to Ray Dalio. Ray, um, you built the uh, largest hedge fund in the world, uh, Bridgewater, and uh, you're also, in your new career, also an author. You've written a number of New York Times best-selling books. In one of your recent books, you talked about five forces that are affecting the global economy. So can you succinctly tell us how these forces are going to move the economy forward the next couple of years or so, adversely or positively? Adversely, I'm a fear, but positively, potentially. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, as a global macro investor for the last 50 years, my job has been to bet on what is going to happen globally macro. And uh, what I learned in my lifetime is that many of the things that surprised me happened with because they didn't happen in my lifetime, but they happened many times in history. 
particularly the 1935, mm -hmm. uh, 1930 uh, to 45 period. So these five forces have always interacted, and I think everything that we're going to talk about today will be related to those five forces, and they interact. And those five forces, of course, are the debt, money, interest rate, um, economy force. The second is the internal order or disorder force. In other words, the internal conflicts that we are having today and the debts that we are having today are the largest since the 1930 to 45 period. And also you go back in history and you've seen enormous amounts of those. They have implications. The third great force, of course, is the international geopolitical force. <clears throat> uh, two great powers uh, that are rival powers. And then, of course, the uh, fact that there isn't a single world order. There isn't a single world power. It's very different than in 1945 when the new world order was created because you have a war, a dominant power comes out, or a dominant powers, and they set the rules, and everybody goes by the rules. Well, this is a very different world. And so uh, those three forces, um, I wanted to examine those over the last 500 years because to think about rises and declines of reserve currencies, um, rises and declines of empires, and so on, I needed to get the perspective over that. And I discovered that the other two great big forces uh, were acts of nature, uh, which droughts, floods, and pandemics have killed more people than wars, and it are a, certainly a dominant force at this time. And then the fifth great force has always been man's inventiveness and technologies. So we have these five forces interacting so everything that we're going to talk about will be related to each one of those. And I think if we step back and we put that, each one of those, in a historic perspective, say, how are their degrees of influence com compared to those in history? The largest wealth gaps since the 1930 to 45 period, populism and so on. So those are the five forces. I think if we're looking at them and their evolution, it's like watching a movie play out over and over again if you have that historical perspective. And as we're looking at it, what we're seeing around the world today as we go into the elections that we're going to see in the United States, which are going to be over irreconcilable differences about wealth and power. And then we look at the geopolitical situation. And then we look at the climate issue. The climate issue is going to cost us it's estimated between five and ten trillion dollars a year in a world GDP that produces a hundred trillion. So anyway, I think that those five big forces, as we look at, if we look at historical perspectives and analogous periods, I think that that'll help us. I think we have to be concerned about that dynamic that's taking right. place. But put, put it simply: for next year, are you optimistic about the global economy or pessimistic? Pessimistic. Pessimistic. Pessimistic about the. the you, you, have, you have a political, you have a monetary, you have an, a, a conflict type of environment. At the same time, you have the greatest inventiveness. We talk about this fabulous technology development that has so much potential okay. to um, produce wonderful things, and then at the also it, it's a, it could be a problem. So if you take the time horizon, the monetary policies that we're going to see and so on will have greater effects on the world. And you look at the world gaps, so you can, it's difficult to be optimistic on that. And I think that now uh, the real issue, I think, is how we deal with each other. Okay. okay? If we, uh, it was said earlier very well, you know, um, peace. If we, can, if we can keep a peace, if we can have a, com a, a healthy, competitive environment, without having a war with each other, we will be in good shape. We will make ad ad adaptations. Okay. Jamie Dimon, uh, you have led for quite a, more than a decade uh, the most profitable and largest market cap bank in the world, J.P. Morgan. So are you optimistic about the economy going forward? And are you as obsessed as many people are in the financial world about whether the Fed is going to increase interest rates again or cut interest rates? Does it make that much difference to the economy as you see it? Yeah, so David, thank you. Folks, uh, thank you for having me here again. And uh, I'll give you the optimistic thing. I think it's wonderful. I've been coming to Saudi Arabia since 2005. 
and what's changed here is so dramatic and so good, uh, and not just what they've done inside Saudi Arabia, but trying to bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, and please, in spite of what happened uh, in Israel, I urge you all to keep up that effort. It is the only way to get there with some leadership from Saudi Arabia uh, for all the folks in the Middle East. And I'm generally an optimist. I think you, you'd be foolish not to look at some of these things taking place today in uh, Ukraine, Middle East. Uh, obviously, my heart goes out for Ukraine, uh, but also it's affecting oil, food, uh, food prices, gas prices, mm -hmm. migration, potential starvation. is probably the most serious thing we faced. And I hear people talking about ESG all the time. I just would put on your table the most serious thing facing mankind is nuclear proliferation. If we're not sitting here 100 years from now, it will be nuclear proliferation. It's not uh, climate. And so, uh, I, so I think when you look at the geopolitical situation, as complex as we've seen, and I, I don't know if it's 1948 or 1938, Obviously, we all hope it goes away. I think it's a little bit of wishful thinking. It's going to take real leadership on the part of many people out there. And then I look at the financial situation, the, the fiscal spending, which is more than it's ever... I'm talking about the United States, but it's almost true around the world. It's more than it's ever been in peacetime, by a long shot, with the highest debt levels we've ever had by government. <clears throat> and there's this kind of omnipotent feeling that central banks and governments can, can manage through all this stuff. I, I, I'm cautious. I don't think it makes a piece of difference whether rates go up 25 basis points or more. Like zero, none, nada. I think whether the whole curve goes up 100 basis points, you know, I would, I urge people, be prepared for it. I don't know if it's going to happen. But I look at what we're seeing today more like the 70s. A lot of spending, a lot of it's going to be wasted. I'm in favor of this whole uh, ESG effort. On the other hand, if you look at the way we're going about it, uh, it's almost like governments want to whack them all and force it but no carbon taxes, no rational way to go about it that would be more important. In the United States, for example, you, know, you can't build pipelines to reduce coal emissions. You can't, build, uh, you can't build, get the permits to build solar and wind uh, and things like that. So we, we better get our act together. I'm hopeful, when I listen to all the R&D, see it around the world, we will make the breakthroughs we need to be climate. But it's going to be a day later and longer than it should be because of our own basic... Uh, uh, incompetence. I also want to add, add one last thing. I'm taking it from Bob Gates. To fix this, it's going to take real leadership from the Western world, in particular uh, America, but leadership which is not just military, diplomatic, development, finance. And this development finance, I don't know if Ajay is still here, what we need in development finance dwarfs what governments can do. So it, it, it can't be done without private capital, and private capital you know, isn't going to come in if they, you know, you built something that gets taken from a government or something like that. So <coughs> we have a lot of work to do. It's one of the reasons I think these events are positive. Uh, but I, I would be quite concerned. And the other thing about when you look at economics, I think people prepare for possibilities and probabilities, not calling one course of action since I've never seen anyone call it. I want to point out that central banks 18 months ago were 100% dead wrong. Okay, so maybe there should be humility about uh, financial forecasting. I, I would be quite cautious about what might happen next so year. It's been uh, said, I think you've commented on this, that you would like to be President of the United States if you could be appointed, maybe not run for it. Do you think you're old enough? You're only in your mid-60s. Do you think that's old enough to be President of the United States? I'm, I, I'm still maturing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Larry Fink uh, started and uh, still runs the largest asset management firm in the world called BlackRock. Uh, Larry, do you see a tidal wave shifting to fixed income investments from equity investments? And do you think that will continue for quite some time? Or do you think that's really not a tidal wave and pe people are basically still investing in equities as much as they did before? Well, again, thank you for being here. It's always great to be in the kingdom. As Jamie said, the transformation of the kingdom in the last seven years is, is totally heartwarming. Um, and I would also just want to echo um, as capitalists, as business leaders, we all, we all have a responsibility to speak a little louder today in a polarizing world, um, in a polarizing world where we're seeing terrorism, we're watching two wars, and here we are trying to talk about, you know, how to build, make it a better world. That's what this <coughs> FII is about. And so uh, we also have to then focus on the unpleasant parts of what's <coughs> denying the world for better growth. So um, we all have to be better humanitarians and we all have to be more focused on how to make sure that the political side of the world uh, understands uh, that uh, 
peace and prosperity does work a lot longer and, uh, and does shape and lifts more human beings uh, to middle class and higher standard of living. Uh, and conflicts actually uh, uh, create much more global problems for, for the majority of the world. Um, we are going to see higher interest rates, David. We're going to see higher interest rates for longer. Um, this reminds me of the 70s. I think some of us were, were on trading desks in the 70s. Um, and um, the 70s was all about bad, bad policy. Today, it's about bad policy again. Um, and big macro shifts, as Ray spoke about it. Um, the polarization, the politicization of supply chains, the fragmentation is a big result of it. That is inflationary. Let me over, over, also say populism is very inflationary because we respond to the immediacy of the moment. We don't talk about long-term issues. Uh, uh, as we see more and more countries move to the far right, we see more um, threats towards immigration. Uh, uh, the lack of immigration uh, is very inflationary, especially in economies like the United States. I'm talking about legal immigration. Um, and so, and then we have, um, we've had a government, I'm talking about the U.S. now, that in 2000, we had an $8 trillion deficit. And today we have a $33 trillion deficit. So the deficit's grown by more than a trillion dollars each year over the last 23 years. That is highly inflationary. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve um, is highly inflationary. And so all these different measures um, are much more structural, much more difficult. So as a result of that, interest rates are going to remain higher. Opportunities for investors are going to be able to be very patient. Um, you could do nothing and enjoy a positive return. All right. So are you expecting a hard landing or a soft landing in the United States, or you just can't project? I, would, I do not. We will not see a hard or a soft landing in 2024. Um, the amount of fiscal stimulus that is just entering the economy, which is very inflationary. The CHIPS Act, the IRA, and the Infrastructure Act, about $970 billion. The largest peacetime non-pandemic moment of fiscal stimulus. At the same time, our central bank is trying to arrest the economy. And, and, and so that's, that, that's just hitting the J-curve. Uh, and, and you see um, in labor settlements right now what's going on in, in labor talk, 20, 25% increases in wages. So I, I don't see a, a problem, but I do believe the Federal Reserve is going to have to raise rates higher, which probably will mean by 25 we may have a soft, we may have a hard landing. That is the only way I see how we're going to be arresting this, but I don't expect it uh, anytime soon. I think the power of the economy, the power of the consumer that Jamie about a lot, um, is giving me comfort that the economy is fine. Obviously, other parts of the world, the, the European economy is, is, is facing much more severe headwinds. And the, the, the one thing that I would say about the U.S. economy, we have a spectacular capital markets. We have the greatest capital markets in the world. Every country is trying to build their own capital markets. I had many conversations yesterday about how the kingdom is trying to raise its capital markets. In our capital markets, we have the most unique mortgage market. 98% of all mortgages are fixed, 30-year fixed. So the transmission of high rates in the U.S. economy just takes much longer to impact the economy. And so that transmission is not being impacted as fast as the transmission of higher rates in other parts of the world. That's in Europe where they have more five-year fixed and floating, especially in the U.K., we see the transmission of higher rates impacting economies faster. So, um, we, you know, and I would just say one last thing, intersecting what Gosser said, intersecting uh, uh, what, what uh, Ajay said, uh, when, when you intersect what technology is going to do, uh, robotics, and the intersection of, of AI and robotics, we are going to have a boost in productivity. And that is going to be the next wave for deflation. That is not going to happen any time in the next few years. So I'm more optimistic today than I was four years ago. The transformation in medicine 
how we are shaping lives through diabetic uh, therapies that are now showing total impact on the health of heart disease, of diabetes, of kidney disease. And we, you know, I know something quite personal to me. The medicines for dementia and Alzheimer's is, is changing the curve of decline by 50%. There are so many reasons to be optimistic. And the pages on the newspapers, on websites, is all about the pessimism. And I'm more of a believer how technology is going to shape these economies and help us out. We may have one or two years of struggling, but I am powerfully optimistic about how technology is going to be rapidly shape our world. Hey, Jane Frazier is uh, running, running City, the CEO of City and uh, one of the largest banks in the United States, and I think the first woman to run a mo major money center bank in the United States. Well, we had to go outside the United States to find a woman to do that, but you're from a native <laughs> of, uh, of um, Ireland. Scotland. Scotland. David, shame <laughs> on you. Okay, so um, are you optimistic or you're pessimistic, pessimistic going forward? And what's the biggest challenge in running City these days or a major money center bank? Um, it's, it's, we're sitting here with the backdrop, which I think we all acknowledge, of uh, the aftermath of the terrorist attack in, in Israel and the, the events that have been unfolding since, and it's desperately sad. Um, so it's hard not to be a little pessimistic given that. On the other hand, we're also, as we talk about, in a world where um, there is a, a new S in ESG, uh, which is security. Be food security, energy security, it can be defense, it can be financial security. And that's certainly a theme that all the, the CEOs around the world are talking about how to build more resilience countries, companies are doing so. So from City's perspective, um, as we operate in many different geographies around the world, as do many colleagues around the table, it's coping with a world where globalization is becoming more fragmented. The risks associated with globalization are getting more connected together. Um, and how do we manage and navigate that? Um, and as, as Ray said, uh, you've got multiple different forces that every company, every leader has to navigate. So I think it's important to have <coughs> big ears and thick skin these days in, uh, in running any enterprise. So for the women that are watching or that are here, uh what would you say is the biggest challenge for a woman to rise up in a major financial service institution? Is there any discrimination anymore? Or is there more than there used to be? And what was the secret to your rising up? Oh, well, let me just point out quite a rather remarkable job the kingdom has done on this front. I've been coming here not quite as long as Jamie, but 15 years. And the last four years have just mm. been spectacular in the change that's happened since coming from COVID. Um, it's exciting to see. And I think this, this country is a good model for how to make sure that there is the education, the access to opportunity. And it's not token gestures, but it's focusing on recruitment, it's focusing on development, it's focusing on the promotion of women and providing access to opportunities. And I have to say, male allies are very important in that rise. Um, and several of you around the table have been wonderful allies to me. Okay, so Patrice Mosepi, um Patrice is, I think, one of the most prominent business people in Africa and very actively involved in philanthropy and business in South Africa. Patrice, why do, does the Western world not really invest that much in Africa, relatively speaking? Uh, I think only 1% of private equity dollars around the world go to Africa every year. Uh, do you see any change occurring in Africa to be more attractive to Western investors, or do you think it's actually going the opposite way? It's very simple. I mean, Africa has to continue to be globally competitive, uh, an exciting destination for investment, both domestically and globally. Uh, investments don't have, investors worldwide don't have to invest in any specific country or continent. There's a lot of exceptional work that has been done in Africa, like many other developing countries. Will there be challenges in the future? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we, we've invested billions of dollars uh, in Africa. We could have invested in other parts of the world. We've invested in India and, and in Europe and in America. So I think overall, there's a, there's a new group of young African leaders, some of the smartest, brightest Africans study in America. You and I are part of the Harvard University Global Advisory Council, exceptional <coughs> talent, uh, bright young African study in London and in other parts of the world. 
I think the future looks great. And what area would somebody want to invest in Africa? Where would you recommend they, what type of things? Venture capital, buyouts, technology? What are the areas you think are particularly attractive? Well, I think the key issue is uh, you've got to find the right partners. And, uh, and as I said, the, the, the bottom line is the perception that there isn't any capital in Africa is misfounded. Uh, the financial services company that we are the biggest shareholder in has got in excess of $80 billion. Uh, I think part of the challenge is we have, to diverse, we have to invest in other parts of the world, but which means we also have to invest outside Africa. Which are the best opportunities? I think technology is changing the face, the opportunities in Africa and in, in the developing world. And, and uh, if you look at uh, the impact, uh, the, the, the fastest growing economies in the world are from the continent. But of course, they start from a low base. So uh, there's lots of investment in agriculture. We will continue in the mining industry. Uh, the, the challenge for us now is to beneficiate in the continent, and, and those beneficiation opportunities have to make commercial sense. But overall, uh, you know, the partnerships globally, and there's a significant amount of investments that's not just going to Africa, but to the rest of the developing world. Okay, so Noel Quinn is the CEO of HSBC, uh, a major European bank. I think the, the, own, the largest bank, uh, one of the largest banks in Europe that did not take any assistance from the government in 07, 08. So as you wake up every morning, are you worried about the European economy or are you more worried about the Chinese economy? You have a big presence in China as well. So what worries you more, the Chinese economy or the European economy? Well, let me talk about the European economy first. Look, it, clearly it had a massive inflationary shock with the gas, the dependency on the gas price. Um, that then led to a big shift in some of the demand curve for a number of industries in Europe. Anything to do with consumption, high street, massive demand curve shift. Um, Europe at the moment is still, in terms of real rates, it's still negative. And if you contrast it with the US, the real rates in the US are positive. So you then got the currency pressure in Europe as well. But that demand shift has created a very low growth economy in Europe, still with high inflation but coming down. And the real shock was the resilience issue. The real shock was the dependency on a single source of energy. Um, and I think if you, if you play that into post-COVID, all industries in the world, all governments of the world have had that shock on resilience. So I've seen a huge amount of diversification of supply chains taking place. Um, and that is impacting China as well. The exports from China are impacted by geopolitics, the need for resilience in supply chain, and the need for diversification. But I think the real challenge for Europe is near-term and probably medium-term growth. It will get inflation under control, although there is the potential for a second wave. Wage inflation is still not under control in Europe, and particularly in the UK. I think we're all seeing evidence of that biting now in our economies. Um, and I, so therefore, there is the potential for persistent high, intre, high interest rates and high inflation in Europe. In, the, in China, I think it's more near-term pressures as they've corrected the economy with some massive policy correction. But medium term, I'm still very confident of the growth opportunities in China. Hindsight is usually 2020, but uh, so let's tell us, in hindsight, was Brexit a good thing for England and a good thing for Europe or uh, not I'm a good gonna, thing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put a different slant on that. Uh, the timing of Brexit was very fortunate in that it coincided with COVID. I think if you look at it from a political point of view, Boris Johnson achieved Brexit at a time when the economy was already flat. And actually the economic impact of COVID was more damaging than the economic, and, and actually the economic impact of Brexit was muted because it was already a very suppressed economy. So when we ran stress tests on the UK economy for Brexit on top of COVID, it didn't make a lot of difference. You were already at rock bottom. What you're now seeing is the emergence of the Brexit overhang come in as the economy is rebooting in Europe and the economy mm -hmm. rebooting in the UK. Okay. The UK, at the moment, if you listen to the chance of the UK is still doing its low GDP mm -hmm. growth. It's still better at the moment than Germany or France. Will it be long term? That's a different matter. Okay. Uh, Steve Schwartzman built uh, Blackstone into the largest uh, market cap uh, alternative investment company. and. Uh, the largest in terms of assets under management, market cap, and so forth. Steve, 
a lot of money has come into alternative investments in recent years, particularly in Blackstone, from retail investors. Um, is that going to continue as the economy maybe slows down a little bit in the United States? Or you think retail is a great source of investment capital for alternative investment firms in the future as well? Well, D David, um, uh, there's $80 trillion uh, in uh, retail investors, uh, and they're only invested in our area. Uh, alternatives, maybe 1%, maybe 2 When I started in the alternative business in 1985, institutions at that time had 1% or 2%. That was it. <laughs> Now they're 25 percent. Uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, and I've been planning on this since 2010, uh, which shows you my timing may be off, uh, that that's, there's no reason why retail investors wouldn't want to get the same uh, type of positive experience uh, that, that institutions do. Uh, you know, alternatives should be able to generate uh, 500 basis points or more uh, than, than not using them. So why wouldn't you use them? Uh, so there were some regulatory inhibitions, but, but now I can tell you uh, from talking to the people who run these systems that, that they want really dramatic uh, increases in alternatives for their customers. Um, uh, institutions are, in one way, a uh, much more stable uh, source of capital uh, because they, they're very disciplined. Uh, they take advantage of dips. Uh, the, the retail investor uh, has more volatility. Sometimes when the world gets, gets in a bad position, they just don't want to invest. So you have to look at the growth uh, over a cycle, uh, and we're doing like really well uh, with this. We have uh, probably a quarter uh, of the trillion dollars we manage that, that comes from uh, retail uh, high net worth uh, investors. Uh, I think that's going to grow as long as you give them a good experience. Uh, and it's also, uh, you have to have very good sales and service. It's much more service intensive than, than you would think. Steve, you also have one of the biggest real estate investment operations in, in the Western world. Um, many people think that the real estate world is going to suffer a uh, decline because interest rates have been high, people aren't coming back to work physically so much that maybe people don't need as much office space. Are you ex expecting a big decline in the value of commercial real estate in major cities, or do you think it's been exaggerated? I, I think it depends on the sub-asset class, David. So uh, office buildings... Um, in the United States to some degree also uh, around the world because the pandemic, people got used to, you know, staying at home. Uh, and it was actually more profitable for them to stay at home because one, they didn't work as hard regardless of what they tell you. Uh, and the second uh, is they don't spend money uh, to commute. Uh, uh, you know, they can make their lunch at home. Uh, uh, they don't have to buy expensive clothes, and so their incomes are, are, are higher. So, so uh, j just um, one or two quick statistics. Uh, in, in the U.S., in the office market, uh, buildings are 20% vacant, um, uh, unleased. Actually, there's another 20% that somebody's leased, but the people don't come in. So you're looking at office buildings that basically are 40% unused. So I expect when those leases roll off, the companies will cut back the amount of space. So say you have 30% uh, unused space in office buildings, that means those office buildings are not survivable, you know, as economic entities. Um, now that. The exception is office buildings that are 10 years old or less. People like being in those. So that's going to have uh, a very bad ending. On the other hand, there are other categories uh, of real estate, like warehouses. They're still going up, you know, like 8 9% a year in terms of leases. 
when somebody rolls off an old lease, they've gone up so much, there's an increase to them of 50 to 60 percent. So there are a variety of, of areas, whether it's student housing, whether it's actually even affordable housing, all kinds of commercial real estate are doing very well. Uh, and so the broad brush that people paint with commercial real estate, which basically, because office buildings are very tall, you can't see them. Uh, and that's sort of your right. vision. Uh, so you're going to have a mixed outcome. Jamie, Jamie you've asked your employees, to, or maybe told all your employees, to come back to work five days a week. Are they doing that? 60% five days a week, 30% are three days a week. I mean, three days a week, mandatory, we track it and it includes coming in on Friday. 10% have always been working from home, if it makes sense. 100% of our MDs are required to go to work every day. I don't think you can lead people and work from home. Okay. Uh, Neil Shen, Neil built the biggest uh, and most successful venture capital business in China under the Sequoia China name. Now he has his own company. Uh, so is it easy as it was 10 years ago to invest in China and uh, do you think it's going to be more complicated for Western investors to invest in China in the near future? Well, it's never been easy to invest in China. Well, you, you made it look easy. You, 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 all, you have to work very hard because there are two things there. One, that, you know, there's a lot of competitions. If you're looking at the, you know, the work ethics, right, people talk about 996, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. In, in six days a week. Uh, I think that's probably to many of those... Uh, you know, startup companies and also to large companies. And the competition is fierce. So in order for you to uh, create a strong return, you really have to uh, you know, find a way to position yourself to provide value, and you work, need to work as hard as your CEOs. The second point I want to make is that <coughs> you need to take a long-term views. And uh, this, you know, obviously, country, just like many others, you're seeing the economic and business cycles up and downs. And the very important thing is to obviously take a long-term view. Uh, you know, luckily, venture capital and growth capital and private equity, which we all uh, are being participating, has been a you know, long-tail asset. But you know, when you make an investment, take a long-term view uh, from the macro perspective as well on the macro perspective, and, and able to uh, you know, stick around and even some of those business might go in up and downs. I think that's probably the most important. Okay. So uh, let me ask you uh, today, uh, you were an early investor in ByteDance, which owns TikTok. Is TikTok gonna ruin Western society as we know it? <laughs> uh, many people think that TikTok is gonna destroy our youth and so forth. Why are you not worried about TikTok destroying society? Well, clearly there are a lot of, uh, I think, you know, uh, issues uh, those companies have to address, not just uh, uh, you know, TikTok. I think in general, when those companies become you know, national champion in China, when they go to uh, overseas countries, uh, they need to obviously work with the local partners and make sure that they are accepted uh, you know, uh, locally uh, as uh, obviously uh, a very, very uh, a good citizen. And it's, it's, it's a you know, process that I have seen, that, you know, uh, you know, like you mentioned, that TikTok has been gone through this. And, and, you know, and obviously, learn how to work in with you know, the partners in the U.S. and partners in Europe and in Middle East, for example, and, and to, uh, to, uh, to really you know, contribute to the ecosystem, not just being 100% you know, commercially. The U.S.-China relationship is not in great shape, some people might say. Um, does that affect your ability to operate in China, or it doesn't make much difference? I, you know, like I said, I think, you know, take a long-term view and obviously, uh, and, you know, focus on the entrepreneurs uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the, you know, entrepreneurs are at, will, you know, help you to create, you know, uh, on, on value and you have to trust them that they're able to navigate all the different regulatory uh, challenges. Okay. David Solomon is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, an iconic and one of the largest investment banks in the world and commercial bank as well. So, David, the M&A business has been down a bit the last year or so. Is that because of interest rates, or why do you think that is? And you see the, the M&A world coming back at some point, and you headed the investment banking part of Goldman before you became CEO, so you know this business pretty well. You know, M&A, &A, David, is a function of confidence. 
And so if you listen to the dialogue today, uh, I say there's great uncertainty. Um, and people always try to frame things. You ask the question very clearly, you know, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? You know, long term, I'm certainly optimistic, but I'm uncertain right now. And if you're a CEO and you're uncertain, you tend to be cautious about doing significant things uh, that change the trajectory of your business and bring outside you know, factors into your business. You know, over time, scale matters enormously in the competitive nature of global businesses. And so M&A activity can ebb and flow, but as people become more certain in the environment, they have to move forward and continue consolidation and scale to compete effectively. You know, we've seen, you know, we've seen in the energy space over the course of the last couple of weeks, a couple of very significant deals to create more scale, more consolidation. Um, I think we had a, an, a, a level of extreme confidence uh, as we were coming out of the pandemic because of all the fiscal stimulus, because of how free money was. And so you saw an extraordinary boom in M&A activity. A very significant portion of it was driven by financial sponsors and private equity capital. That's all now reset. And so, you know, my strong view is M&A activity over reasonable periods of time, decades, grows in parallel with economic growth and market cap expansion. We'll continue on that journey and you'll see a pickup in strategic M&A. A few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, it seemed like half the classes at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, other really good schools wanted to go to Goldman Sachs right out of college. Is that still the case? People still rushing in? How many employees do you have coming in or prospective employees every year? And do you, can you take all these people or has it gone down and people now want to go into tech startups or public service or something? Well, there's a lot of competition for good people in the world. You know, Goldman Sachs uh, it feels very good about where it sits competitively to attract people. We had 265,000 applications for 2,600 analyst jobs out of university and we had over a million people apply for positions at Goldman Sachs last year. We have 45,000 employees at Goldman Sachs. So it's certainly a very interesting, compelling place for people to come learn, meet other people, grow, gain experience. A small portion of them stay and build their careers in our organization. That's the way it's always been. Most of them go out into the world and you know, wind up at events like this or running businesses, doing all sorts of interesting things. So we have, we have a compelling, I think, human capital ecosystem. I think all businesses like ours, all professional services businesses, have to have a very compelling, competitive ecosystem for talent. Talent is so important in all the businesses around the table. If you don't find your own way of having that compelling ecosystem, if you don't give people good experience, good education, good mentorship, good economic opportunity, an ability to meet and network with people that they want to be around, it makes it much more challenging over time to run a good business. Okay, and let me ask you another question. You asked your employees to come back, or maybe told your employees to come back. Are they coming back and they're actually physically in the office now? We, we are, our business is by and large operating the same way now, on a global basis, the same way now as it did before the pandemic. I would say in the United States on Fridays, there's a slight difference versus what there was before the pandemic, but we're pretty close. And I'd, you know, I'd also amplify that we run a big global business, we operate in 50 countries, you know, outside of the United States, there's a lot less discussion about this issue than there is inside the United States. But for our organization, we have encouraged, and I think people have realized they want to be together. 50% of the people who work at Goldman Sachs are in their 20s. Um, when you're in your 20s, you want to be with other people, uh, learning, growing, experiencing. So we've managed to get our organization, we think, to a very good place. Okay. Uh, Shamara, I guess you're used to being last because W is uh, yes. probably at the end of the 60 alphabet. 60 years at the back end of the alphabet. It's probably not the first time that you've been the last, but uh, you're obviously uh, very successful in the business world. For those who don't know, she's the CEO of Macquarie, which is a very large Australian-based bank and probably the leader in um, investing in, in uh, infrastructure-related kinds of projects. So is infrastructure investing now being affected by artificial intelligence, by ESG, and are you as active in that area as you were before? And is it as profitable as it was before? Yeah, well, I mean, if I could just start by saying um, infrastructure investment, we've been investing now for 30 years, trying to develop this as a separate asset class, and we still see it as being in its first innings, because um, to the point Steve was making about representation in people's portfolios out of this sort of more than 100 trillion of managed assets in the world, 
it's grown to being only 1.2% at this point. And <coughs> while there is scope for other asset classes to go, we think there's reasons this one should. So we view the whole world as an emerging market for infrastructure investing. And we think that's both from the point of view of the savers whose money gets allocated through their portfolios, that it has a good liability match to those sort of savings. It gives good diversification in terms of correlation to hedge funds, public investments, other alternatives. Um, and also in times of rising rates, it gives some resilience because the revenue line is impacted by that. So we think in investors' world, there's scope for more to be allocated. But we also think, much more importantly, in the communities where we invest, infrastructure investment does drive improved living standards and prosperity, and hopefully will go some way then to reducing the instability in the world. RJ was talking about dealing with uh, poverty as well as livable planet. And so that's why we are passionate about trying to drive more investment in this area. And in terms of um, recent developments, you know, our population has gone from about 1.8 billion, where it was for 200,000 years, just in the last year, has rocketed to 8 billion people on this planet and going to 10. And that's driving the need for way, way more investment in this class. You talked about AI and ESG, but um, if I could talk about four buckets of where we invest as examples. Um, energy and utilities is a very basic one, and I know there's work done by the Rockefeller Foundation saying access to reliable energy is the biggest driver of improving living standards in the world. And um, today, um, World Bank data says that 1.1 billion people don't have access to energy, and more worryingly, half of those don't have access to clean water. So huge investment needed in utilities, in infrastructure around the world to lift people's living standards. Also, if I could talk about transportation infrastructure, another really basic area where communities need this investment. Um, it gives people access to higher paying jobs if they can travel, it drives more connectivity. Um, and also, even in the developed world, you know, as the populations get bigger, we need to trade more and specialise seaborne trade needs to pick up, so we need a lot more investment in the developed and developing world in digital infrastructure, in transport infrastructure, and then I was just moving to digital, where not just AI, it's the latest manifestation in what human beings have amazingly, in my 30-year working life, done with technology. It just blows my mind, and we now um, have much more um, ability to deliver r remote areas, education, healthcare, digitally. So. Um, fiber optic networks, towers, <coughs> data centers that His Excellency was talking about all need investment. And then the last one when you talked about ESG is climate change response. Where, so, and you were going to ask me a question, so I'll stop there. Well, I'm going to ask you, for most people here who haven't been to Australia, why should somebody want to invest in Australia? Is it a good place in which to invest um, generally? What, what is the advantage of investing there? And related to that, uh, US, uh, the the Australia-China relationship has been complicated lately. Has that affected your bank in any way? Um, yeah, well, first of all, in terms of investment in Australia, we actually have really good foreign direct investment. And I was going to say in infrastructure, just to finish on that, RJ was saying there's a lot of private capital wanting to invest. The big challenge is investable opportunities and de-risking them. And the reason Australia does attract a lot of investment is because there is a reliable climate there to invest. So huge energy companies, transport companies coming to invest, and similar to what's happening here in the Kingdom, setting a glide path for private capital, setting up regulatory frameworks, etc. Um, but more importantly, the deep expertise of the private sector to de-risk. So um, Australia is attracting a lot of investment. Australia, like a lot of countries, now sits in the situation where the geopolitical tension is increasing between China and the US. And I guess, um, you know, I've heard African leaders say this, they want to deal with everyone in the world. And we had people talking to the importance of peace and harmony in the world. Ideally, we want to engage with everyone. Australia has a very strong alliance with the US, but also with China, we're really working hard to improve relationships as a country. Um, so for Macquarie as a bank, um, our business is very domestically Australian in what we do in banking. But in terms of infrastructure investment, all of these regions are important and attractive to us. So yes, we want to invest in the developed world, but China, we do a lot in data centers, in renewable energy. Did Macquarie have a lot of women CEOs before you? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, we had six people and they were all male. So, um, so far, I, I like Jane, I'm batting okay. first. Hopefully. So, yeah, sir, um, you are involved with the building of a major city in Saudi Arabia, Neom, which I guess is going to have, uh, going to be really the, the wave of the future, not going to have carbon, I guess, and it's going to be all electric in many ways. Uh, how, what's the progress of that? And is it costing more than you thought? And why should somebody want to invest in that project if they were having some spare capital to invest in Saudi Arabia? Um, so it took us a um, few years in doing the planning because this is a really long-term um, project. Um, we have it in phases. Uh, the first phase should be between 2027 and 28, and hopefully we will um, get at least 300,000 uh, people residing over there. Um, and then the other phases will be in the uh, in, uh, 2030 and mid-30s, and then 2040 and uh, 2045. The um, aspirations and the ambitions that we have is to have somewhere between seven to nine mil million people residing uh, there. This is a huge line, about 174 kilometers. As you said, it's, um, the carbon footprint there should be zero. And we're not talking about net zero, no, it is zero. Everything that we're using over there is uh, based on renewable energy. All the infrastructure is going to be underground, trains and other vehicles. The, um, the challenge that we have is how to uh, use the mobility vertically and horizontally w with the least amount of time to um, go from point A to point uh, B. So we started, uh, I mean, now even if you fly over uh, Neom, you can see the line, uh, the infrastructure. So we started with, um, with the infrastructure there, and uh, it is uh, closely monitored by the uh, chairman of our board and the chairman of NEOM, who is the Crown Prince. He has um, almost um, monthly or bi-weekly board meetings just to right. follow up on what we're doing. But NEOM is bigger than the line. NEOM has 16 different sectors and has seven main regional uh, uh, projects. One of them is um, Oxagon, which is the first industrial city in the world that is based all uh, in uh, renewable. So you've, go ahead. I'm sorry, you've go been ahead. involved uh, a fair bit, I think it's fair to say, in the golf world. Golf. Yeah. Um, by hanging out with a lot of famous golfers, have your, has your own golf game improved? Your handicap gone down or? It's no. getting worse by the day, I'm worse. telling you. Okay. <laughs> you get all kinds of tips from them, you cannot do Has it gotten better? All right. So uh, we haven't talked about uh, some ongoing wars that are now, uh, unfortunately, in, in facing the world. Uh, does anybody want to comment on whether this is going to affect the global economy or your investment outlook for the world? Uh, Larry or, or Jamie or Steve, anybody want to talk? Ray, anybody, whether what we see now in, in uh, Gaza what we see in Ukraine. Is that affecting your outlook on the global economy and, and your willing, willingness to invest in certain areas? Larry? I would, I would start off saying we don't know the duration of the, the conflicts. So obviously, um, I'm, in, in most of my travels in the last three, two weeks, um, the word Ukraine was never uttered. Um, obviously, that we need to talk about that. Um, obviously, the situation in Gaza and Israel um, we're watching it, we're re reading about it immediately today, every day. I wake up to read what's going on and talk to my team. Jamie? There's no question it, if these things are not resolved. Um, it probably means more global terrorism, which means more insecurity, which means more society is going to be fearful, less hope. And when there's less hope, um, we see contractions in our economies. And so I think um, there are consequences to war uh, and to fear and to instability, and I think it will lead to less hope and a lot more fear, and it will then lead to a much greater contraction if we don't navigate this as a world. And that's why I think we all have that responsibility to talk about it 
and to try to do something okay. about it. Jane or, or Jamie or Steve? Steve? Yeah, after um, the 73 war, you had a recession. Uh, so, um, you know, history doesn't always repeat exactly uh, the way, uh, you know, you'd think. Um, but, but, but it doesn't help a uh, global economy. W one thing I wanted to add, just sort of uh, slightly off point about inflation, because that's been a big topic and overlay. Um, you know, we, we have about 250 companies that we own with 750,000 people. Uh, and um, we're seeing a different picture uh, than is uh, reflected here. Uh, 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 the input costs in our company, uh, companies, you know, that, that's what it costs to make stuff. Uh, in, in, in the third quarter, uh, were zero increase. And that runs counter to this hot inflation. Uh, and we're seeing with the Fed, um, our revenue growth has gone from 13% in the first, um, uh, in, uh, in the second quarter to 8% growth, still growing. But that's a pretty big decline uh, in a quarter. But, but the profits are up 16%. So the only way you get that it, with, with decreasing rates of sales is it's not costing you as much to manufacture things. Um, so so that, that tells me, also, uh, a year ago, we were, companies were growing people 10%. Now they're growing people zero. So it says to me that, that the Fed is actually having pretty good impact in, in terms of taking inflation uh, out of the system. Uh, and a third, roughly, of the CPI uh, is in shelter. A year ago, that was running 12, 13 percent. Now it's roughly around 1 percent. But the Fed doesn't measure it that way. They average the high numbers with where you are now. So if you put that together, you, 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 at least the way we see it, you, you're really having a, a much lower uh, inflation than some of the numbers uh, that are being uh, reported. Okay. So anything, anybody else want to comment on the wars ongoing? What's going to impact your assessment? If, if not, uh, let me uh, go. We have about seven minutes left. Let me just go around everybody. If you could just say, what makes you optimistic about the future in one or two words? Is there anything that makes you optimistic about the future? Uh, why don't we start here? Um, I mean, again, um, I would give the same answer that I gave um, last year. Um, we have a plan. We have uh, objectives and we have, um, uh, like, political will, right uh, proposition and right people to execute. So I'm very much um, optimistic in the future. And I discussed um, uh, this before uh, with Ray. Um, he had some pessimistic views, and uh, me and some others, we had some positive, op op optimistic views. And we discussed why we had um, different views, because we we're both very informed and educated about uh, certain numbers and stats and economic uh, events. I think the, the reason why you would be pessimist or optimist is if you are a passive <clears throat> investor or an active investor, and the difference between the two, if you're going to the financial markets only, that's a passive investment because you really cannot change what you're investing in. But if you're going into um, establishing things, greenfield projects, building uh, uh, data centers, building cities, building <laughs> things of that nature, you are an active investor and you can work, especially for, for me personally, as the governor of BIF, working with the government, investing uh, the monies of the government of the country, 
we can put the whole ecosystem to work in our advantage. So I am uh, very much optimistic. Larry, optimistic? What makes you optimistic? I, I think um, as a species, we solve problems. Okay. Um, so I think um, over the long here, history of humanity, we solve problems. We may have a lot of short-term problems. We may have issues, but um, I, I would continue to be heavily long-term invested over a long cycle. Okay, Shane? The average worker today spends 80% of their time processing and 20% on content. AI will turn that on its head. 80-20 will go the other way. That is a great enrichment of human lives. Hey, Jamie, what makes you optimistic? I, I think we've already mentioned the enormous progress Saudi Arabia's made, but if you go around the world, that was true for Ireland years ago, South Korea, uh, several other countries, and other countries have gone the wrong way. So technology, uh, I think the R&D, the brain power of both investors and, and is extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's not a given. I, I think that this is a very complex world. It's getting more complex, and it's quite dangerous. Steve? Uh, uh, David, I look at um, you know, sort of the future a bit with all the factors from this amazing panel, frankly. It's just a privilege to be here. But, but I also look at it from a cyclical point of view. I've been through six of these cycles in my career, and, and now we're coming off the top, and, and we're starting to go down. So, so that would say to me that you know, next year perhaps is not so wonderful, uh, but then you'll hit your bottom and, and then, you know, we'll go up again. And, and, and given all the positive things people talking about, the trend is up, uh, but we're living in a post-pandemic world. And that's what's driven the spending after, uh, uh, you know, sort of the pandemic, which led to the inflation. <clears throat> which leads, leads to the higher rates, which then leads to the central banks sort of trying to kill that, and, and then we'll go up again after that. Okay. Patrice, what makes you optimistic? I mean, this world has got a lot of exceptional people, and I mean, people around this table and various others, truly uh, committed, passionate to make the world a better place, the youth in the developing world, throughout the world, and also human creativity technology, and, and Yasser, Saudi is doing exceptional work, mm -hmm. not just in Saudi, but in the developing world and in Africa. And right. you know, lots of good people committed to a better world. Shamara, what makes you optimistic? Um, same as Larry and Patrice, I really believe in humanity and our ability to extend our lifespans, the quality of our lives. Um, we solved COVID and we've come out with incredible technology now for virtual communication. So I think we just have to put our heads down, the privileged people in this room, and get on with Thank delivering you. the solutions. Neil, you know what makes you optimistic? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic because the younger generations, are, and, and I think they are the future of the economic growth. And you know, every single time when I spend time with the young CEOs, young entrepreneurs, I come in back with a more conviction for the future. And what we need to do is give them support, capital, and on top of that, uh, mentorship. And obviously, the growth of the world will be driven by large companies, but also be driven by SMEs and try to disrupt those industries. And also, I think, you know, giving the younger generation hope that they can create social mobility, which is also very important. Right. No? Um, I think there's going to be two or three breakthrough technologies in healthcare that will change people's lives dramatically. And I think there'll be a couple of breakthrough technologies in other industries. Um, and I think 20, 30 years from now, we'll look back and say, those two or three or four or five things changed the world. I'm negative on one thing. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna give you a negative, not just an optimistic. Right. I, am, I am concerned about a tipping point on fiscal deficits. All right. um, I think it won't come gradually. It, when it comes, it will come fast. And I think there are a number of economies in the world where right. there could be a tipping point we and it will hit hard. A minute ago. Optimistic? What makes you optimistic? Uh, His Excellency said it very well. Um, I, there, there is um, deals that are going on, and there's an entrepreneurship that is phenomenal. So the, there are more deals that can be made in order to make more change. We're seeing this happen all around in all dimensions. And the entrepreneurship that is happening is, is fantastic. I mean, the magic formula is find the most talented, inventive people and provide them with the capital and the ability to do that. Now, that changes very much by location, 
Okay, so I, when you ask me to deal with the world as a whole, it's a different thing. One of the reasons that I think this place is so exciting is because it's a talent magnet for, bring, for bringing people like this together to be able to do this entrepreneurship. I think you'll see renaissance states. In other words, the neutral countries. And there are just three basic things you need to do. You need to earn more than you spend, have a good income statement and balance sheet. You need to compete well but not fight internally, and you need to stay out of a world war. Those places who do that, which do that, and do this innovation, I think are going to have a wonderful time. In history, there are the, well, I'll leave it at that. All right, David, <laughs> optimistic? Uh, optimistic always, but I'd, I'd agree with what, what, what Jamie said. It's not a given, but I'd point to three simple things that have been said in a number of ways. Advancements in science, advancements in technology, and the optimism and resiliency of the human spirit. All right, well, um, this has been a very exciting, interesting panel. How many of you have been able to convince your children that what you do is so interesting they want to do the same thing you're doing? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir, I want to thank you for assembling everything and thank Richard for putting it together. Thank you very much. Well done, David.